You're coming in loud and clear. Over. Hey, Maniacs. Hey, Mystery Maniacs. Mystery Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to mystery TV. Each week, we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. This week, Poirot, episode three of season two, The Lost Mine. Oh, it's lost, all right. Yeah, oh, it is. There's a lot I'm, of lost things. <laughs> I'm Mark. I'm Sarah. I am so glad to be recording today. Oh, I've missed doing the podcast on a regular basis. The last two months have been loony. We've missed you. We're happy to be back. We're excited. This is a really fun episode of Poirot. For those of you who know, um, one of our kids did have a pretty major surgery this week. He's doing very, very well. Yep. So thank you for all of your well wishes. Yeah, I mean, I just... I could not be happier with how he's recovering. Yep. So far, so good. All super positive and all super good. Olive so. is is almost back to normal after our few days with no power. If you are a newsletter reader, you saw a picture of Olive in a, in a towel that we took of her. <laughs> she decided she did not like our new dark lifestyle and <laughs> wanted the electricity back on. And what do you know? It's back. Yes. And we're back. We're going to do four episodes in July. That's the plan. Promise. <laughs> we're here. We're doing it. Till the asteroid hits. Yeah. <laughs> you just never know what's going to happen, do you? And if you want to get in contact with us or join the mailing list, you can reach us here. If you want to reach out to the Maniacs, you can email us at mysterymaniacspodcast at gmail.com. You can join our Facebook page, comment on our posts on Twitter or Instagram, or join our subreddit. You can also message us directly. We'd love to hear from you. This is one of my favorite Poirots from this season. It's my favorite one in this season because of Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> Which, it's not the, even the main plot. It's not <laughs> even in the short story, the original this is based on. But I love the Monopoly plot. Yep. The Monopoly plot is fantastic. It is does come from a short story from the 20s. Poirot gets a bunch of shares in the mind and he see, and Hastings goes, how did you get them? And he tells the whole story of how he got them. Because the stock market subplot discussion is there in the yes, original, right? Absolutely. We do have a few folks who are in this episode who are in Midsummers, going back to our roots. Oh, we have Lord Pearson. Yes. Played by Anthony Bate. He's in uh, a season four episode, Garden of Death. Yes. Uh, Jameson, played by John Cording, is in Death and Chorus in season nine. But probably most importantly, the lobby clerk of the St. James Hotel. Yes. I mean, he's you know, key he is, to everything. He has a fantastic blue coat. <laughs> Played by Richard Albrecht. He's in a season 14 episode, The Oblong Murders. Yes, he is. Yeah. So, I have a trivia question for you. Okay. In which episode of Midsummer do they play Monopoly? You should be able to suss this out. And yes, I can answer some questions about it. Is it John or Tom? It's Tom. And it's The Monopoly. And that's a clue. It's Christmas. Yes. Yeah. It's the Christmas episode. Which Christmas episode? The one where they're wearing the paper hats. Yeah. It's the Ghost of Christmas Past. That's it. That episode. They're yeah. playing the... Because... Because he's playing it with Joyce's parents. Joyce's parents bring the Monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> and he's excited to get out of there. Oh, great. Somebody's been murdered. Awesome. I'm out. <laughs> Rescue me. I looked up Agatha Christie board games. There's not a lot, if any... One the of them state we, is very careful with what they license. Yeah. So. One of them we have, which is Agatha Christie's Death and the Cards. Mm -hmm. It's like a card game. We have that game. Now, uh, we did have a listener who asked me to review the Poirot video games. Oh, yeah. And I would. I think I'm going to do this over July. Okay. So they're, they're, I think they're all available on Switch so I can play them in the evenings while we're watching TV. Yeah. And uh, I will indeed try to, to play some of the Poirot video games and give a review of those. By the way, speaking of TV, it's, it's a little different than things that we usually recommend. Um, but something we have been watching lately, and I don't think we've talked about it before, is The Traitors. 
Never in my entire life have I ever wanted to get on a plane and go and slap someone. <laughs> there, it's, oh my god! It's a reality show. Yep. There's one in. There's the American one. There's Australia. There's New Zealand. There's a British one, and there will soon be a Canadian one, which I don't understand. Like, oh, I'm the traitor. I'm going to kill you. I'm. I'm sorry. So the, but I think it's Scandinavian originally. Yes, I think it is Scandinavian. So the the premise of this show is they bring together twenty people in a house, and some of them are traitors, and um, their the goal is to accumulate money through challenges. But every day they have a vote, and they they try to vote on who they think is a traitor, and if they're right, it's one less traitor. Yes. And then there's also a murder each night where the traitors get to murder one of the faithful, they call them, the non-traitors. It's non -traitors. essentially the game of werewolf if you've played it. Yeah. Yeah. And in the end, when there's only a few players left, if there is even one traitor left, the traitor gets all the money. Yep. But if there are no traitors left, then the faithful who are left split the money it is season two of the australian uh, trader watch season one it's fine yeah it's great but season two may be some of the best reality tv i've ever seen and it has the ending yeah the <laughs> ending is epic don't look it up in advance just watch it where did we watch that on peacock we watched it on peacock yeah because oh we haven't even we'll talk about this but maybe next week we haven't even begun to speak that there are Olympics coming. Yeah. But anyway, if you if you like reality shows at all, it's not like interpersonal drama. It's not like, oh, my God, you kissed him. Oh, my no. God. There's none of that. It is all game all the time. Very strategic. The only thing I don't like about it is I really, really, really wish, and I think you do too, that there was an alternative version of each season where you don't know as the viewer who the traders are. Yeah, you know who the so traders are. So you could are. try to figure it out too. Yeah, but I it's wish. really fun to watch the traders try to figure out how to not get caught and how to murder people. And if, it's fun. If I watched the current season of Trader Australia, season two, and I didn't know who the traders were, my head would have actually exploded at the end of Yeah, it. I think it would have. <laughs> So there's a recommendation for you. If you're looking for something to watch and you have any appetite for reality TV, give it a shot. Absolutely. Alan Cumming is the host of, is that the U.S. or the English version? The U.S. version. That's the U.S. version. Yeah. Um, and he's so over the top awesome. And we prefer the regular people than the celebrities. Sometimes they're celebrities. Yeah. But yeah. we like the regular people. Yeah. But it's fun. Anyway. All right. Ready to talk about The Lost Mine? Yes. Originally aired January 21st, 1990, directed by Edward Bennett and written by Michael Barker, Baker, sorry, and uh, David Renwick. So let's just say right off the top, this was written in the 20s, the original story for it. Yeah. Not, not so racist. Not. For some it, reason, I, the 1990 it's version. 1920s racist. <laughs> yeah. 1990s. Super racist. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah. Like, it's, wow. I know that they're just trying to recreate the society of the time, but I think it's even m m more. Yeah. Than it, the, like they exaggerate it. Yeah. Anyway, right off the bat, just wanted to get that out of the way. There's some anti-immigrant crap in this episode. We that, know the difference between Burmese, Chinese. No, they're just the Asian. Yeah. The, well, they call them all Chinamen. Yeah. It's, it's just, you just would not say now. Did you see uh, the the young lady of the evening who finds the body, what her description was in IMDb? Isn't she just Asian tart? A Chinese tart. Chinese tart. Yes. Yeah. Me love you long time, Johnny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that poor woman. Did you look up that woman at all? No. So, okay, good. Because I know you have a, a bad movie. And yeah. I she she was in the a lot of famous movies for a very short period because she died and I don't know how she died or why she like died. young she yeah died. she died young oh, that's sad yeah well she's good at saying me love you long time Johnny like she was in the, <laughs> I don't know if she's a good actor she or not. was in the New Emperor and a whole bunch of movies she was super cool let's uh, talk Monopoly oh boy let us talk Monopoly because. Before the we before we dive <laughs> most serious Monopoly <laughs> yes. players are playing. Before we go into the scenes of Monopoly, 
Whose idea was it to play, you think? Hastings or Poirot? I think Hastings brought the game to Poirot because he thought he could beat him. Yeah. And he, it, my theory is that Hastings beats him in the first game because then Poirot reads the rules, right? And then the next game, Poirot is like flush with money. See, Poirot strikes me as the kind of person who would say, I'll play this game with you, but I'm going to read the rules first. I'm not just going to trust you. I would think so. I'm too. surprised that he doesn't know all the rules. He's surprised that he can't build hotels on railroads, like because he hasn't read the rules thoroughly before he started. Yes. But the edition that they're playing is the 1936 edition based on the patent number that's on the board that yes. they show. So this is a little anachronistic. This game, the version that they're playing would not have actually been released until the year after this episode yes. is set. But my favorite thing about this edition that they're playing, because I'm a dork and I looked it up and read the rules and everything, it's before Uncle Moneybags. Yes. So there's just this generic guy on the cover. Yeah. Who looks like excited. Yeah. But in the rules, if you have a question about the game, you have to send a self-addressed stamped envelope to the company with your question and they will answer it and send it back to you. Wow. I want to see the letters they got. Yes, I also want to like, see. My Uncle Henry says, you can't do this, and I think you can, and we've debated over this line. And I mean, can you imagine? The, uh, Monopoly inspires arguments anyway. Yes. <laughs> and when it's new, you know, <laughs> I just think some of those must have been just priceless. Exactly. And that would be such a fun job, to reply to questions about board games <laughs> back then. Not yeah, now. Not, not now. now. I wouldn't want to do it now, but back then, yeah. it would have been fun. So you and I talked a little bit beforehand about weird editions of Monopoly, because, of course, there are gazillions So of... first of all, do you like to play Monopoly? Um, I've never played Monopoly with you, by the way. I can take it. I can leave it. I, I think it's kind of tedious, really. It's really looked down upon in the board game community that I am part of. Well, there's no real strategy to it. No. It's it, it, it's just kind of a grind. You go around and around and around. I'll tell around. you how much I'll tell you a sad story about how much of a grind it is. How long is a game have you played? Probably two months by myself. Oh. How many players were you playing? Four. Oh. I'm so sorry. I had no one to play with. I wish I knew you then. So it's the winter in Canada. I would have talked you out I, of it. I come home from school. I've read every book in the house 15 times. <laughs> I've brought every book home from the library I can. I've read them on the bus. Did you at least pretend to have different personalities? Bought, like, did I, you have the risk averse player and, yes. the, and the greedy player? Oh, you no, know I did. Did you I, cheat against yourself? I, I, I did not cheat. <laughs> God, I couldn't do that. But. I would, I would definitely move around the table. I had four chairs and the card table set up. And uh, and your would, parents didn't think that maybe you needed help? No. <laughs> when you were my getting parents, up and moving from one chair to the next? did not pay attention to me <laughs> in the very least at well, all. Well, I'm guessing you won. I also don't think I had even close to all this stuff. Like you were missing pieces? Well, I had four other, two other brothers and two older sisters and an aunt. Yeah. The fact of that Monopoly game getting into my hands in pristine shape was impossible. And then, like, let's be honest, <laughs> Carl and Madonna didn't buy me any games. <laughs> we spent enough money on books. <laughs> so I challenged you to find the weirdest version of Monopoly oh that boy, you could find. I have some strange versions of Monopoly. Well, okay, I've got a couple that I think are really, really weird too. So okay. give I'm me a, give me one of yours. Okay. There's all sorts of ways that we can go about this. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I went personal for a one way of looking at this. There is no Monopoly game from the small town I grew up in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there is from a neighboring town that we have a listener in. Oh. The I there is Arm Prior Apolly. <laughs> where the the town of Apolly Yes, Opoly. Armprior Opoly. The uh, Chamber of Commerce of Armprior, Ontario, got together and got all the businesses to sign up, and they made a Armprior-based Monopoly game. That they sell in the gift shop or I something. I guess so. Town hall, whatever. Yes. 
It was a fundraiser. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then the second personal one I have is there's an IU monopoly. Mm -hmm. But our house is not on it. Oh. So. Is where we work on it? Where you work is on it. Yeah. The Kelly School of Business is on it. Well, you work for the Kelly School well, of Business you, too. Well, you work in the building. Mm -hmm. I work in some shack out behind the other shacks. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay, so you give me some of your strange ones because I'm sure we have a couple on the same. So I didn't, I purposefully ruled out ones that were not authorized versions. Like, I have a different section for unauthorized, so we can cover those. <laughs> we can't go on forever about this. <laughs> we could do a whole podcast on Monopoly. I found Iron Maiden Monopoly. Wow, that's spectacular. <laughs> if you don't know, Iron Maiden. Heavy metal band started yes. in the late 70s. Chris Dickinson, I believe his name is. It's epic. Yeah. So the Bruce Dickinson, sorry. So oh the my board, All the this, Iron instead Maiden. of streets, they're like major um, concerts that they did oh, that's cool. for di different albums. That's cool. And the little figurines are like guitars and drums they and a, mic stands. They have, and an, they have a, like a skeletal guy that's on Eddie. A, Eddie. Yeah. Is he one of the figures? Yeah. yeah. You can play Eddie's head. Yeah. That's super cool. It's, it's really, if you're a fan of Iron Maiden, like they got it right. Yeah. It's not, it's not just like surface Iron Maiden. It is like heavy duty. Yeah. I'm not a fan of the band necessarily, but I but was there's really, nothing wrong with them. I was super impressed with the depth that they went through for it. Well, you know, heavy metal bands like Kiss and Iron Maiden and a couple of other ones really know how to market themselves. Yes. Okay. You give me one of yours. Okay. From the corporate versions, because uh -huh. uh, there's a lot of corporate versions that are given out to employees. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a Bass Pro Fishing. Yeah. There's a FedEx version. And Best Buy has one. And there's a Target edition. Yeah. Too, the so. Target one even has different rules. Yeah. Yeah. There's also one that is um, one I've actually seen in the marketing department at work that is um, different brands. So you can buy like Pillsbury or oh, okay. Orida or oh, Coca-Cola. Cool. I think Coca-Cola is Boardwalk or something. Okay. Goonies. Goonies. Ghostbusters. Yeah. I would actually like to see the Goonies one. Yeah. I love that movie. We're going to be watching it soon. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, most expensive that you can currently buy. Well, there's the super, super deluxe version. No, no, no. I mean, the Jeffrey Parker Home of Luxury Board Games version. Oh. Which is made of alligator leather. Oh. Which is 700,000 pounds. Oh. <laughs> That's more than the one. The I cards saw. are gold and silver. Yeah, that one's stupid. That's yeah, stupid. That my ex really likes Monopoly, and yeah. so I think when we were in college, maybe for Christmas one year, my mom bought him the Time Life edition, which is a cherry wood oh, yeah, that case, one. And, yeah. and every player has a drawer that you yeah. pull out that you keep your money in. Yeah, it was very nice. Yes, with a table that it goes on. That's super cool. Um. Canadian Monopoly. I do have Canadian Monopoly, but I, I also have a distinctive brand of Canadian Monopoly. Well, the generic Canadian edition of Monopoly, you can play a dog sled, a locomotive, a grizzly, a canoe, a moose, a float plane, a boot, or Gordie Howe. Yes. Or Gretzky or whoever yes. you want to pretend the Who hockey player the is. Hockey player is. I was I was kind of Speaking thinking of, there's like a one. Toronto Maple Leafs version. Yeah, of course uh, there is. Which there probably is one for every major sports team, I would think. Yes, uh, NFL, NHL, the NBA. Toronto Maple Leafs version. You can play a goalie, a Zamboni, a hockey player. <laughs> I want to be a Zamboni. Skates, <laughs> uh, an NHL medallion, or I cannot believe this, a Stanley Cup. Um, that's just mean. That's just mean. They have a Stanley Cup on the front of the box. This is the reason why we haven't won a cup. I'm guessing they made a version years. of it for every NHL team. Yeah. And that's those are all the same. I'm sure they're all the same. It's just the, the board and box yeah. are different. Yeah. There's Cthulhu Monopoly. Oh. Which I'd kind of like to see. But the weirdest one that I found that is an official version that isn't a spin-off of like the Simpsons or some show or whatever yeah. there's a ton of those was the bass fishing monopoly oh okay so you are a fisherman and you compete to buy the best fishing spots in America 
Mm. And that's cool. There's little fish all over it. And I bet you the little things are fish too. The the tokens are yeah. fish. But I don't know why you get sent to jail in that game. I don't know either. Like for not having a fishing license or Oh, for the IU game, you don't go to jail. You know where you go? Home. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it should be the drunk tank. That's it what really happens be. in Bloomington. You get to pick up trash the next no, day. that you go home. Okay, I have three very strange ones. Okay, quick, because we're boring people One now. is a corporate <laughs> version, but it's a weird corporate version, which is the Vegemite edition of Monopoly, which you can buy on Amazon. Vegemite? Vegemite. What are the... I don't know. The locations on the, it. All I had was the box. Okay. I almost bought it to find out. <laughs> and then uh, there's a Scott the Waz Monopoly. He's a YouTuber. I say, I don't even so, know what that is. But the thing I did was I belong to a board game online community called Board Game Geek. Uh-huh. Uh, we have a big convention coming up at the end of this month called Gen Con. Uh <laughs> 60,000 nerds. Yeah. It's, a, it's the biggest board game convention in North America. Luckily, it's an hour drive from me. Yeah. So they rank games. So I looked at the lowest ranking Monopoly version. Oh, okay. <laughs> from a community that hates Monopoly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now they rank games out of zero to 10. Mm -hmm. There are no zeros and there are no 0.5s. That are actual games. Okay. There are expansions that are <laughs> yeah. like listed as zero and stuff. Coming in at number one as the lowest ranked Monopoly version is Jojo Swilla. I don't know what that is. She is a singer that's on Nickelodeon. Oh. It's one of these vanity brand Monopoly. Monopolies. Yeah. I know there's unicorns versus llamas now. Yep. Monopoly. That that was rated quite highly. Uh, okay. The second worst Monopoly rating, also coming in at one point out of 10, is Home Bargains. Now, Home Bargains is like the dollar store in England. Oh. It's this weird corporate version. And the color scheme is like a designer threw up. Oh. It's just, it's red and yellow, but not McDonald's yellow. <laughs> and it's, oh, it's very bad. Very, very bad. So those are the two worst rated McDonald's, uh, two worst rated Monopoly, Monopoly games on Board Game Geek. Well, our listeners are kind of nerdy too. So if any of you have ever played a really obnoxious version of Monopoly, let us know. There's no Poirot Monopoly. There's no Midsummer no Monopoly. There's Midsummer Cluedo because that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. You would solve a, a mystery. Okay. We're actually going to talk about the episode now. Han Wu Ling. <laughs> Whoa. Those teeth are not good. What do you... So we we know... This is a spoiler podcast if you didn't know. I'm assuming everybody knows that. We, we find out later this is not the real Han Wu Ling and that... His his teeth have been black blacked out. What do you think he would put on them? I don't know. Back I, then, like but maybe, I did maybe wonder, just some coal. I did wonder what cigarettes he was smoking. Those gold filtered yeah. ones. I don't know, but they're posh. They're super this posh. This guy shows up just on an average weekday in the tails. And, yeah. You know. Well, did you notice? He's fancy. So there is a nice bit of editing here in the cold open. Hastings moves his piece. To which St. Is, James. Which is a shoe. Oh, yeah. And we see the shoe come out of the car. Oh, uh, that's and, nice. I didn't And then that. Poirot moves his piece, which is... Top hat? The top hat. And we see him with the top hat in the hotel. Of the traditional pieces, which one's your favorite to play? Uh, I like the boot. I like the race car. And the little Scotty dog. I like the Scotty dog. Yeah. Mostly because it's really easy to pick up. Yes. I always found the iron difficult to pick up. I do I do remember now that we've talked about it, and boy, we've talked about Monopoly. When I played Monopoly by myself, I did not have all the pieces, so I had to use something else like a tokens from some sorry or tokens something. <laughs> from something else. Checkers. Yeah. <laughs> You've won ten pounds in a beauty contest. How did they keep film a this? straight face? How did they film this? 
Hastings is so fantastic. He's so. They both dress up for the game. Didn't you notice that? They're both still dressed from being out. I'm I sure. Guess. They've gone out to dinner, the theater. They're still in black tie and they've sat down to play Monopoly in the middle of the night. Yes. Yeah. This is an all skill game, says Hastings. <laughs> the dice in the cup. He just. Yeah. He just shakes him and he shakes him and he. Sh- I've played games with people like that. It's like, just roll the dice. You are a wheezing grumpus. <laughs> <laughs> Will you just roll the dice? Yes. He blows on him. <laughs> you know why people blow on dice? Well, it's good luck. I yeah. don't know why they do it to put their the breath of their soul in it or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to, it's superstition or whatever. Yeah. I, I read tons of things that give you all kinds of theories about blowing lady luck on them or you know, blowing your mojo on them or whatever. But the one theory that I am most kind of convinced by is that it might have originated with men who used to play dice in the street. Yeah. Because it was illegal, right, to play dice. And they would blow on them to blow off dust and dirt that they might have picked up. That that actually makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But if you did it, and you rolled something good, maybe the next time you go like, well, I'm going to blow them in again because it worked last time. And then it just becomes a good luck thing. You know, we lived in a precious time, a very precious time. And we both lived through this. Mm. We lived in a time before phones and after smoking. So we had nothing to do in meetings while we were away. <laughs> <laughs> but before cell phones. Yep. And after you could smoke at work. Yep. Yeah. That, that period People just sat there. <laughs> that meeting room, it, it just blows my mind that it, I, I can't even fathom being in a meeting at work and somebody whipping out a stogie and lighting it. It would just, I mean, they may as well like start juggling knives. It would just be so strange. Like I came in at the very tail of this, 93, 94 And I remember there being ashtrays on people's desks, but they're not using them. Wow. I remember people smoking in the office after hours because they didn't want to get caught, but they'd still smoke Mm -hmm. in the the building. Like the two French guys I played pool with all the time. After hours, they shut their door and they smoked the whole time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But... Like I said, th- that ended pretty quickly in the mid '90s, and then there's nothing till cell phones. Yeah, like that ten year period of nothing to do, nothing to do in meetings. <laughs> well, back at this point, you could have a shot of whiskey and a cigar while you were in a meeting. No big deal. Yep. So Poirot goes to the bank. Mm-hmm. This, like, there is a plot to this episode. It doesn't involve Monopoly <laughs> or Poirot going to the bank. The London but, and Shanghai bank. But they are the two best parts of yes. this episode. Our favorites anyway. 444 pounds, four shillings, and four pence. Which would be about 26,000 pounds today. Yeah. It's a it's lot a of lot. money. I understand they put this in because it fits Poirot's personality. It makes no sense. That he is precise. Yep. And that he would be exceptionally aware of his own money. Yes. And how much he has. He is frugal. He, <laughs> he is frugal. He shows it when he's playing Monopoly. He has it all written down in Monopoly. Yeah. He's frugal and tight. Yep. But he does make considerable money. Yeah. He's not poor. No. But logistically, I don't know how he could claim to keep that balance all the time, unless he has a savings account at the same bank. And anytime he spends any money from his checking account, he's moving in the precise amount from his savings account to keep it at that balance. Which doesn't make any, <laughs> like, <coughs> it is important to keep an amount of money in your bank account. <laughs> it's important to know how much you have. <laughs> But logistically, yeah. to keep that exact amount, I do not understand how that you would need, be possible. Need, well, it's it's for the show to make it fun. Yeah. Right, of course. And he's overdrawn. <laughs> he's so mad. <laughs> Especially when he thinks it's 50 and the guy comes back and goes, actually, it's 60. <laughs> he's outraged, which is $500 minus yes. what he's got, right? Yeah. So this is, then he goes home and he's angry with, with Hastings because he's winning the game. Yeah. So this is continuation of Dame from the night before. Yeah. 
because Monopoly then, goes on for freaking ever. There is a great moment of irony where the bank president comes and Poirot thinks it's because of the overdraft. He actually thinks the president of the bank would come to his personal home to apologize. All the a, board of governors are so upset about for this. For a banking error. So, that's even surprising. Poirot, even Poirot is like... <laughs> It's not that big of a deal, but okay. <laughs> no, no, you know, no, it's about Wu Ling being missing, right? <laughs> Why does he go to Poirot? He's the bad guy. It's a good question, except that the entire board of directors has seen Wu Ling not show up. So I guess. So he needs to appear as if he is making an effort to find and him. And he would be a famous member of the bank. They would know him. Yeah. So. Wu Ling is coming to London because he has a map that leads to a silver mine. The lost mine. That has been lost in history, but is thought to be a great source of silver. Like there is still considerable wealth there to be found, right? He talks about it's 200 miles inland from Rangoon, which is in Burma at this time, which is Myanmar now. Yeah. So Pearson the president of the bank has arranged for Wu Ling to sell the map to the bank. And the board of directors is there because they all have to agree that the board, that the bank is going to invest in this map to invest in this mine. So they will all know why Wu Ling is coming. And when he doesn't appear, I think Pearson has to make every effort to look like he's trying to find him, (laughs) even though he knows exactly where he is. Of course he does. I mean, why Pearson goes to the trouble of having a fake Wu Ling check into the hotel. I I mean, he doesn't even have to do that. He could just say, well, he just never showed up. Yeah. Like he never got to London for all we know. Yes. Hey, sailor. Oh, wait, it's an actual sailor. (laughs) Yeah. Who is doing the worst drunk walk I've ever seen. (laughs) Like, if you're so drunk that you can't even stay on the same side of the street, you're probably not getting home. Yes. Like, that is way, way across the street. And we see... Cobbled streets must have been so bad for yeah. drunk people. <laughs> you would just fall on your face all the time. We see a dead guy. We see a guy in a suit who's an American. And we see who Han Wu Ling is supposedly. Dead in the alley yep. in his long johns. Yes. I did think, and I don't. maybe I'm giving them more credit than they deserve, but... So the real Wu Ling is not a tiny man. He's heftier. Yes. And when you see the fake Wu Ling, the imposter, in the hotel, the suit doesn't quite fit him. Yeah. It looks baggy on him. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's smart. Yeah. Because they they put him in a suit that doesn't quite fit. Because they did a good job. Clearly, they've stripped this guy of his suit. Yes. And he wears a complete set of long johns under his suit. Who does that? In August. Back from the days of... Do you know what that guy looks like? Uh, I sent him a bunch of letters, I guess, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) I've never actually met him. I know he's Chinese. This guy's Chinese. It must be him. Yeah. Jap is special in this whole episode. He just wants to be done as soon as possible. Yeah, we haven't even got to police technology. (laughs) The war room? (laughs) From my notes, is this a war room? No, it's the surveillance room. They search Wu Ling's hotel room, find matches, a notebook that that mentions Charles Lester. Which is clearly planted. Like, how could it not be? It's the only thing under the bed. Yeah. And then Jap is like, come see how real police work is done. Yes. And even the music they play, it's like. Yeah. There's like 30 people in one room. Again, it's so the most, many people. It's the most women we've ever seen in the police the station. The set is never used again. <laughs> they're they're wearing their headsets. Yep. They've got the slidey sticks, the map. The cars. Moving the little cars. <laughs> and the bad guy is a little black hockey puck. Yes, <laughs> the bad guy is a little black hockey puck. <laughs> it makes me think of the later episode when the FBI come. Yes. And... They're looking for a bad guy and Jap has to work with them. And they're like, calling all cars, calling all cars. They need to talk to these policemen, though, these plainclothes policemen about how to talk on the radio less obviously. Yes. Because they're they're doing surveillance and the guy keeps lifting the handset up, which is like four inches across. Yes. To his mouth in full view of anybody going, this is unit seven to unit eight, you know, and the one. The one guy, my favorite thing about the surveillance room 
is that there's like a dais. Yes. At the front with a guy sitting at like a podium, like, like he's the keeper of the, like, like, like a, a an auction caller or something, yes. you know? And Jap just takes the mic from him. Yeah. Grabs Jap- it. They, they gave Philip Jackson a direction, which was touch this technology. Like you've never touched technology before. Yes. And he does a great job. And like, you've just learned the parlance of radio communication. Yeah. And you're really being strict to it. Yes. You're coming in loud and clear over. So, they find the guy they're looking for. Where is he at? So this is... What, is it? Reginald Dyer. Yes, sorry. Reginald Dyer. And he's in he's in Chinatown. He's in the Chow Chat Cat. Chow, yeah, Chow Cat Chow Sauna. Chow Cat Sauna on Rupert Street. Uh, now. In Whitechapel. No, it's in Soho. Soho? Yes. Okay. So I, I went to Rupert Street on <laughs> Google Maps, and I went down the entire length of Rupert Street. I would, I would love for Google to show me an overview of the world and all the places where you have drugged that little guy onto the map and crawled <laughs> around on the street just to see all the places that you've been sneaky about to see what's so, actually there. So it is. Is the Chow Cat Sauna still there, Mark? <laughs> so it is prime Soho on the north side of Chinatown. So they got the name of the street right. Okay. It is it is part gay district, part Chinatown. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you have things like the Cockery, which is one of those places that sells uh, essentially uh, desserts that look like penises. <laughs> There was a silence there because I'm just staring at you in disbelief. There's a place called the Cockery. Yes. That sells penis shaped desserts. Yes, it's closed now, but yes. It's a business. Yes. There's a. It's okay. A, it's right beside the Bubbleology, the bubble tea place. You know what my response to that is? That's sexist. I think so. I mean, they should have had some more shapes in there. I. <laughs> When you said bubble tea next door, I was like, what are they, boob-shaped bubbles or and what? What's going on? From there, I turned to look at the stores across the street from that, and there was the White Lily Massage Spa. Oh, so, so it is still there. It's just changed names. It's just changed names. It's okay. still there. Okay. I'm thinking maybe it's, uh, well, I would have said maybe it's a b- bit more reputable than the Chow Cat is supposed to be. But since it's across the street from the cockery, I'm not so sure. No. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to assume anything. It's not a very long street, but I looked at every business on it. I'm shocked that the cockery is out of business now. <laughs> it is. Like, really? I mean, how could that not survive? I think it moved locations. There's a number. If you search for the cockery online, <laughs> there are a number of locations. I believe it's an Italian company because the website's in Italian. So. <laughs> But the other ones are chicken restaurants. Yes. <laughs> so. What do you mean the cockery is Italian? <laughs> that's what I got. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. There's a poster on the if wall. If that's what you say, I'll go with it. I'm... There's a poster on this wall that has a weird connection. Mm-hmm. George White's 1935 Scandals, an actual American movie. It's a movie poster. Okay. Has Jane Wyman in it. She plays a showgirl, which are called Scandals in this particular movie. Okay. Do you know who Jane Wyman is? Mm. She's Ronald Reagan's first wife. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. She was in uh, Falcon Crest. Not the soap. Yeah. The oh, soap. okay. She was in Falcon Crest. So everyone in this episode pretends that they are Jack Nicholson talking about Chinatown. <laughs> So Chinatown is a is a movie from the 70s starring Jack Nicholson. It's famous. It's very good. It's directed by a horrible person. I don't care. It's noir. The horrible person is in it and gets his nose hurt. Cheer for that. Okay, who's the horrible person? Roman Polanski. Okay. So the the movie is fantastic. But the whole point is that Jack Nicholson doesn't want to go back to Chinatown. So he talks about it like, oh, Chinatown, this horrible place. And the place of his trauma. Everyone in here talks about Chinatown the same way. But they're doing it because they're racist. Yes. <laughs> because it's a den of iniquity and a nest of vipers and all the evil happens there because they're racist. Yeah. Speaking of racist, Charles Lester is an American. Yeah, he's American. And his wife is American. She's also American. Uh, he has 
Uh, he has a stock stock broker. He has a booklet in his office. <laughs> I was like, it's called Investing Made Easy by Charles Lester. I could make that book now. <laughs> With all of your notebook equipment? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of investing, is he scammy or is he just a typical stockbroker of his time? So in the short story, he actually works for the bank and has contacted Wu Ling already. And that's what happens. The nameplate on his business looks classy and he has no, partners. I think he's okay for an opium addict. <laughs> okay. For an American opium addict who's a stockbroker. Hastings really doesn't need to take any advice from anyone other than don't invest in things. You'll drive them into the ground. Uh, and this is an, another time when I hear the word scheme. Yeah. Which in America, scheme has a negative it's a connotation. Con, con men do schemes. Right. There is no proper investment scheme. Yes. You don't use scheme to... And so I, I always assume that it's negative. It's, it is not at all in the UK. It just means that it, there's a plan, right? It's a plan. Yeah. But to us, it's, oh, he's got some interesting schemes mm. here. Well, they're fishy because they're schemes, right? Yeah. I get a method, a, a little modicum of revenge here mm. because I sit clearly in Poirot's camp. Oh, about the date? Yes. From the hotel register. So the idea is that Poirot knows that there's something up with Americans because of the way the date is written in the register. Well, he suspects that the man pretending to be Wu Ling is American because he writes month, day, year. Which is for backwards people, according to Poirot. Very backwards people. I I could not agree more. <laughs> I don't know why we do it that way. I, it, I've lived in the United States for 25 years. At least once a week, I write the date wrong. I just don't know why we do it that way. I don't understand it either. Listeners, if you know the reason why Americans write it month, day, year, instead of day, month, year, tell us. Smallest to largest. It's, it makes sense. It does. I understand it. I get it. We just don't do it that way. Yeah. And I don't know why. It's funny. Every once in a while, I'll uh, put the date. Uh, like, I put the date on the reminder text, mm -hmm. on the reminder message and i'll get people from england going don't you mean this i'm like yes i do mean that so but if most were, of our listeners are american if you so were writing it out longhand would you write like 16th of may or would you write may 16th when i was taught to write the date longhand mm -hmm. i was taught to write 16th of may oh, okay. 1969 or whatever date i was in school so well mrs lester shows up because her husband is missing. Why is she? Like, I don't like her because she is a character from Sherlock Holmes. Yes. She's the convenient, pretty woman who's come asking for help. Yeah. I'm not sure why she knows to go to Poirot. I, I don't know either. And then she's Unless like, her husband went home that night and said, Hercule Poirot came to see me today. Maybe. And, maybe. and then she's like, well, when he's missing, I'm going to start there. Here's an incredibly important clue. His passport. That I found in his dirty suit that he hung back up in his closet. Uh, Your husband's bad. Yeah. Poirot's phone gets turned off. <laughs> <laughs> the look that he gives Miss Lemon Miss Lemon where it's like he doesn't believe her it is the most offensive thing to ever happen to him i i like in his head he must think everybody on the street knows his phone's been turned off for non payment this is beyond me it's no so very good start sheet it's so embarrassing oh my gosh but i just think like how, uh, I yeah. just go back his monthly expenses are 26,000 pounds I don't know because, okay, so he gets paid 500 pounds for the case. Yeah, for one case. Well, it was a naval secrets case. I don't care. That's 44K. Yeah. He's, okay, first of all, buy Miss Lemon a typewriter. <laughs> Jesus, Murphy. But does he live one case at, to one case at a time? Because otherwise, how does paying his regular bills overdraw him? Yeah. 400 and, well, 500 pounds yeah. on his account. Yeah. 26,000 pounds in between cases. It's, it's, it's so weird. I don't understand. The math is not there, but the fun is. Yes. I'll let it go. Yeah. So the real Wu Ling's passport is in Lester's suit. Yes. And she just hands it over and Poirot's like, got it. Yes. Click. Done. So they go find Lester. 
Yeah, at the Opium Den. At the in the, in the Red, Red Dragon, Dragon Casino. I, my note is Jap or the set designers are not subtle. No, <laughs> it's Big Trouble in Little China. It is. It is. It's even over more over the top than that. Well, did you notice the owner has really long fingernails? Yeah. <laughs> It's not the crawl, it's the crawl. <laughs> like, I'm surprised he's not wearing like wizards outfits or yeah, you know, with, like, like with long like Fu, Manchu, Fu Manchu beards. Fu Manchu mustache. Uh, well, Wu Ling, the imposter Wu Ling has that mustache. Yeah. Where the sides are really long. Yeah. Yeah. Press the, the dragon's red eye to access the yeah. opium den. It's, it's just everything's on the nose or the like, red eye. Wouldn't everybody in the casino see people going in and out of there? Yeah. That's not a secret door. That's not a way to. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But Lester's. Like, and then you're just you're back to Sherlock Holmes, like passed out in the opium den. Yes, exactly. Is it? illegal now, at this in, point in the no it's not illegal now in the short story poirot has to go to the den to find lester mm-hmm. and he pretends to be an opium addict oh and he it really upsets him he really doesn't want to do it does he take opium no he does not take does opium. he walk in and go i'm an opium addict kind of <laughs> look at me opium yeah tasty num num i want some <laughs> <laughs> How much is it? I'm overdrawn already. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Reggie Dyer's there because he's a scumbag, but he has nothing to do with the case. No. He's just got suitcases full of money, a skeezy lawyer, yep. and he's dealing drugs. Yep. So he's just come back from Hong Kong Where and brought a whole bunch of drugs with him, yep. basically. Yeah. He's really got nothing to do with so it. So then they go away from the Red Dragon, and then they come right back. Right. To the Red Dragon. But this time, there's the bank president, and there's a great rut roll moment. <laughs> <laughs> the bank president, I'm going to guess, he's not used to being a criminal. Yes, because he's really bad. Because he basically outs himself. That's his passport. No, is Monopoly instructions. Ruh roll. <laughs> I meant, um, th- that's what I meant. I meant, I meant those are Monopoly instructions. Yeah. Obviously, that's Where what I meant. Dark dreams are dreamed. Wow, Jap gets poetic. <laughs> the Monopoly. So you think it's two Monopoly games because yes. they're playing again? Yes. And Hastings goes to jail. Yes. And you think he actually was being sent to jail? Oh my gosh, he's so upset. And then he has to pay two thousand to Poirot. <laughs> Anybody who's ever played Monopoly to the actual end of the game knows that that Co- moment. That you collect up all your money and your properties and you just throw it at the Yeah, you're like, this is everything I've got left. Now, in my ex-husband's family, where games are played differently, yes, that would not be the end of the game. Oh. If you were short paying that debt, then now you owe me. You're in debt. House rules. Wow. Like, like when you're out of money, when I was playing alone, <laughs> I did not sit in your chair and go, oh, I'm out of money. Did you name the other players? Of was course it, I named the other players. Was it like players? Mark, Marcus, Marquis? And <laughs> no, no, they had other names. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, why not? I mean, give them real names. Yeah. So you, if you played Monopoly again, there would be a note in the box that said, Mark is in debt $200 and you would get that much less. That's like you are not out of debt. The house rules from Monopoly are insane, but that's a super insane one. There's also a socialism version of Monopoly that's very much a parody where if you don't have the money to pay your debt, it comes out of the community chest. Oh, it comes out of the bank to cover your debts. Well, actually, well, actually, there's a version of communist Monopoly that was produced in printed in a 1930s communist youth magazine, which is the game was called Towards a Soviet America, <laughs> in which you visit all the capitalist America's social injustices on the way to the Soviet America, the center of the board. Did McCarthy just show up if you bought that game? <laughs> I guess. If you're getting the communist yeah, I guess you're youth already in magazine, trouble. you're already in trouble. <laughs> so Pearson did it, right? Yep. He intercepted Wu Ling right off the boat. Yep. Killed him or had his lackeys killed him. Yep. Took the map because the map that they present to him is like a page from an atlas that yes. they just tore out or something. <laughs> like we don't get to see it, 
but maybe it just has a big red X. It's like, yeah. mine is here. <laughs> like, here be gold yeah. or something here silver. Be, here be silver. So he's a bad guy. He's and going he's away. trying to frame Lester. Le- yeah. Lester. Because Lester's passed out next to the dead body and yep. stumbles out of the alley and the Chinese tart screams. Um, that's what she's called. Yep. The Chinese tart. Then we get to the real atrocity of this episode. Okay. Which is that Miss Lemon has basically misplaced a 500 pound check. And I not don't think it's it. Miss Lemon who did this. I think it's Poirot that did this. I think Poirot had the check because he gets all the mail, right? No, she processes it. She processes it, but I'm sure she gave him the letter with the check in it to get to the bank because she can't take it to the bank. She does. She leaves right away to do it. It's all screwed up. Because I don't think it's Miss Lemon. I think Poirot was looking for something to write down his Monopoly scores, and he did it. So you think the paper that's with the check is notes from the Monopoly game? It is. It's that. That's how Miss Lemon discovers it, is that he's writing notes on oh. the Monopoly. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I thought the paper that was with the check was his invoice. No, no, no. And I was like, it's handwritten, Poirot. No, come no, on. No, no. It's his, it's his notes from the Monopoly game. So have they been playing Monopoly for 10 days? I, I don't know. I do not know. <laughs> now, my father was famous. Monopoly has driven Poirot crazy. My, my father was absolutely famous for writing numbers on the backs of things that he needed to deposit. This is a thing that happened in my house. Your father forgot to deposit that check again. We have to find it. And he would have written like on the envelope that it was in, or he would have doodled on the back of the actual check? On the back of the envelope. Okay. He would have written numbers. Like totaling something up, taking taking notes, doing math on paper. That is prime Carl Bell. (laughs) And then the envelope is gone and the yep. the check is in it and it's just sitting somewhere. I'm sure we lost some things. <laughs> and I remember I couldn't leave homework on the table because I would find numbers on the back of it. Yeah. He'd just pick up the closest thing and do number work on it. See, now... Which, my f- poor father. My father was fantastic. I love him. I miss him. He's been gone for years now, but he never went to high school. Mm-hmm. He wasn't a math wizard. Yeah. I understand <laughs> he, working things out on he, paper. He was a man who needed a calculator before we had calculators mm. that were prevalent. Well, in our home now, if you leave something out and it's on paper, it'll end up with doodles on it because we have a child who is an illustrator yes. and doodles without thinking it. just starts drawing things, yes. faces on the side of a tax form or something. Yes. Like, who did this? Why, why am I even asking who did this? I know who did this. Why did you do it? So the injustice is that Poirot should have deposited that check and forgot, in did, my opinion. Did it to his own self then. Did it to his then own Then it's self. not an atrocity. Yes. You know what is an atrocity? What? The horrible movie I have for you. Oh boy, lay it on me. Because that is the whole story of The Lost Mine. Uh, good dead body, but there's only one of them, so we can't really pick one. I other. wouldn't even say he's good. He's face down. He's, yeah. I mean, does, he's in Long John's in the Dark. It's, it's not impressive. Long John's in the Dark. Nah. It's, uh, there's no Long John's in the Dark. He monopoly. didn't wave his arms around. No. Yeah. That, okay. I, that I saw. Bad movie me. All right. So James Saxon, who plays Reggie Dyer yes. in this episode of Poirot, is in this 1981 movie. Oh, this is right in my wheelhouse. I know. Here's your summary. Let's okay. see it. Let's see if you have seen this three out of ten Ooh. movie. Ooh. It's a bad. It's a bad as the Monopoly review. It's a bad, bad. A writer suffering from agoraphobia rents an isolated house so she can concentrate on her writing. She doesn't know the house is a former brothel and is inhabited by the ghosts of dead prostitutes. So this is not the... There's a lot of, I'm a writer with writer's block, so I'm in a house movies. Mm -hmm. There's tons of these. Yep. But the brothel is the interesting part. Is this a British or an American movie? American. It's an American movie. Do not know this movie. I'll even tell you. 82? 81. I'll tell you who it's directed by. Okay. Armand Westing. Is that name familiar to you? No. Good. He's a porn director. Oh. This was his only non-porn movie. And I got to think that probably some of these ghost ladies. It was a little porny. It's a little porny. Because they're (laughs) prostitutes. And this would have been around the time of Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, a surprising movie about 
prostitutes and it's policemen? It's more Amityville horror. Oh, which would have been around the right time, too. Mm-hmm. No. Maybe, like, House of the Rising Sun or something like... No, the where? name makes no sense to okay. me whatsoever. Okay. This movie is called The Nesting. What? <laughs> Cockery. It's called The Nesting. I don't know the why it's nesting? called The Nesting. Don't know. Never heard or seen this movie. Don't know. All I know is the ghost of the madam of this brothel is wicked scary and in her face all the time. <laughs> and her son comes with her to this house and he sees dead ladies. <laughs> Does he say dead naked ladies? <laughs> There's a lot of... Ghosty lingerie, I think. But apparently it's quite scary. It has a sickle on the cover. Yeah. And the house that it's set in is really famous. It's this octagonal house in upstate New York. Oh, it's on Prime for $1.99. Guess what I'm watching tomorrow? (laughs) The nesting. (laughs) But that is a point for me. That is a horrible movie that you have not seen. That is indeed a horrible movie that I have not seen. Booyah. Thank you for tuning in to our lovely podcast. We left Mr. you with a couple Maniac. of questions. What's yep. your what's the worst monopoly you've seen? Do you know why Americans write the date the way that we do? Yep. Next week, July 15th. How? How? Is it the middle of July Is already? Is it the middle of July already? The Cornish Mystery. Season the 2, Cornish episode 4. Cornish Mystery. Dentists and debutantes. Oh, Tarts. The 22nd, The Disappearance of Mr. Davershaw, Davenheim, mm-hmm. which I love that episode. It's very good. And then uh, July 29th, The Double Sin. And it's just Double Sin. Yes. So, yep. All right. Until then, bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. What would they call a shop that had vagina shaped stuff? The Holery? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, if it was in England, it would be the fannery. Yeah, I guess. The fanny shop. Bye, maniacs. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> fanny desserts? I don't know. Sweet fanny. My sweet fanny. Thanks for joining us on the Mystery Maniacs podcast. If you enjoyed our crazy podcast today, don't miss out on future episodes. Follow us on social media for updates, behind the scenes content, and exclusive sneak peeks. Subscribe, like, and share to spread the word. Bye, maniacs. But I will say I saw them on Instagram and bought them, and I'm really glad I did because my butt's very happy.